Okay, so I have a little 60 second um, display here. And I want you to, you know, we all talk about suck, swallow, breathe, and what a baby's doing and how it's more difficult to be feeding than it is to be just doing non-nutritive suck. And we explain that in depth and again and again to families and the medical team because everyone always thinks that when the baby's sucking great on the pacifier that oh they're going to be they're going to be a great feeder but when in reality they aren't needing to stop the respiration to be doing the sucking they can do that whenever they want when you add in the demands of feeding then you have to pause respiration and we know from research that a baby's need to swallow or what they're going to do if they start eating, their swallowing is going to trump their respiration, or at least it should. It doesn't always happen in, in everyone. Um, but a lot of times a baby's going to continue swallowing and they're going to stop breathing as often. And when they stop that breath to do suck, swallow, breathe, that lasts for anywhere from about a half a second to a second and a half. And that's that can be really challenging and a, de and a demand on babies, especially those with a baseline fast respiratory rate. So I want you to think about, or at least this is something that helps me, if a baby's, baby's doing suck, swallow, breathe, it's really, I explain this to families and try to show them how often a baby needs a breath. So if they're breathing, if you think about the clap as a breath, and they're breathing this fast when they're not even eating. Breath, 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 breath. The pattern for when they're gonna be eating and doing suck, swallow, breathe is suck, swallow, breath, suck, swallow, breath, suck, swallow, breath, suck, swallow, breath. Suck, swallow, breath. And they pause their respiration every single time that they are doing their swallowing. And that's that can really put a demand on them. And so what's gonna happen is the baby's either gonna continue swallowing and hold their breath because they're free to take one, or they're gonna take a breath when they're supposed to be swallowing and they're gonna aspirate. And that's part of what our assessment is sometimes that's clear and sometimes it's not clear but the next level that I want you to think about is even if a baby is able to compensate and do that and override their need for respiration and they keep pushing through and even if they start taking if they're what we call self pacing what effect that has on their minute ventilation they're used to breathing at a certain amount and that, that baby's going to fatigue a lot faster. So there's lots of things that we can do to implement, even if a baby's getting by, to be able to support them and slow them down so they can be able to better coordinate over time. So let's look at this baby. Think about how long is, is it taking for milk to be transferred and why? Is it a very full breast or is the baby just really efficient? And how many sucks is it taking to transfer milk and to swallow? Also, how long are those suck bursts?
Okay, so there's a lot to look at in that video and you can look at it again. Respiratory wise, yes, he was working, but he was coordinating pretty well. But the difference between what are the respiratory needs at baseline versus what are the respiratory needs when he's feeding and how, how far from his baseline is that? And why are they there? Is it just him needing to work that much harder and not being able to keep up? Is it the flow rate that just is going a lot faster and he's transferring and because he's swallowing much more frequently, then that is more respiratorily taxing. And think about the difference of the milk, milk availability. <clears throat> when he first got latched, he immediately starts transferring milk after a couple socks. And think about a baby who, he only did maybe one or two non-nutritive sucks and that let that letdown came right away. Think about a baby who needs to get organized before they're latching to the breast and they need to get that coordination and sustain of that non-nutritive motor plan and that breathing before they get the milk introduced and be able to coordinate that. That baby's gonna look a lot different at a breast that has milk that's ready to go and is efficient and they're transferring immediately versus a baby who's doing a little bit of work to get that let down. So it's just be thinking about the effect of the flow rate that the baby is, is getting, the mom's milk supply and the amount in the breast, and we'll get we'll get there in a minute. But all of that makes plays a role in the baby's ability to to feed safely. So look at these two pictures that show a baby who's already latched and the baby had just been latched. And do they look the same or do they look different? They look close to the same, but even just the small differences of hand positioning can make a difference in stability. On the left, the hand's slightly higher and we really would want hands a little bit lower that are supporting more of your shoulder. And that can help grade the baby's ability, one, when you're latching to search, but then also as you're trying to ensure stability, it helps them maintain that positioning a little bit more. But remember, we don't wanna fix what's not broken in most cases. There's a balance between facilitating success and putting measures into place when there's a baby's at risk for aspiration or just overall reduced ability to, to latch and to maintain stability versus letting things naturally happen between a mom and the baby and then just offering support or input as is accepted or whether it, or and when it's needed. Here's an example of just the central pattern generators and I just like this diagram. It just shows the complexity of everything really relying on one another. So when you're doing a bedside assessment for oral feeding, you're initially looking at isolated systems and how they function independently, but then you move on to how they integrate with each other. So always just thinking about how everything that a baby's doing and feeling and experiencing really plays off each other on a neural level as well. So when you start thinking about where the breakdown's occurring, you think about that checklist that we talked about before. You have to think about the recovery expectation. You have to think about pulmonary health. Is there room for error? Talking to the medical team, how liberal can you be? And then where's that patient in the recovery stage? In order to be able to move forward towards those goals, you need to get back to the basics and get back to the breast in whatever way that that is. And so we're going to talk a little bit of specific examples of cases and different strategies that can be implemented in different populations.